medical chaos. Now, while I'm sure this is a term we've all become relatively familiar with in light of recent, well, medical chaos, before pandemic craziness, 2004 was the initial defining year of what medical chaos truly embodied to me. Now, not only was the greatest first daughter my parents could have ever hoped for born, that first daughter being me, of course, my family was going through medical complication after medical complication, from my mom's blood condition to paying for a newborn baby me. There was just a lot going on, and my family was really going through it. Of course, I was a baby and whatnot during this time, so I don't personally have any memories and only really have the recollections of my family, but I do remember being very young when I first found out that 2004 wasn't just a special year because I was born, but 2004 was a special year because it also marked the end of my grandmother's chemotherapy treatment. My paternal grandmother, who I call Granny, was an extraordinary person. And as we all know, terrible things can happen to extraordinary people. In her case, that being a series of medical complications in the early 2000s, most notably being her diagnosis with breast cancer. From thinning, thinning hair to shorter and shorter face lengths, my baby book actually doubles as a physical documentation of the effects chemotherapy ended up having on my granny. And to anyone that knows anyone or knows personally what chemotherapy is like, you know that it's no joke of a drug. Chemotherapy is a process we use to stop the spread of cancerous tumors. But take a moment to think of every cell in your body that divides really, really fast. Maybe that's hair, blood, throat, digestive cells, anything along those lines. Just know that the speed of those cell divisions is similar enough to the speed of cancer cell divisions that chemotherapy cannot distinguish them from each other, meaning chemotherapy treats slash kills both healthy and bad cells really, really well. And it was this access to chemotherapy that always kind of annoyed me because, yes, it was such a blessing, but it was also such a curse. I say blessing because she lived 15 or so years cancer-free, but a curse because it haunted her and the rest of our family every year since. I mean, from taking pills to help her torn up immune system, to having kidney complications, and just having some sort of new medical discrepancy practically every month since, chemotherapy, at least in my observations growing up, seemed like a life lengthener and not exactly like a life improver. And being the idealist that I am, I kind of always thought modern medicine should be so much better than this. And, I mean, being the daughter of two biologists that I am, I coped in the only way I knew how to. I learned a lot of science. And honestly, more science than some teenage girl should be allowed to know, like obsessively learn science. But nonetheless, I actually took AP Chemistry last year and was introduced to this pathway of pharmacy, where I think I found the answer to this question of, shouldn't modern medicine be better? Now, the answer to this question lies in a really cool molecule we like to call the liposome. The liposome is a nanotransporter, so think of the smallest thing you've ever seen. Maybe a speck of dust, maybe that's a strand of hair, whatever it may be. The smallest thing the naked eye can see is roughly 4,000 times larger than the average liposome. And I know, it is really hard to picture this being 3D because it is so tiny, but it is in the sense that it's spherical and really similar to our cells' vesicles, meaning it has a hollow middle that can hold and transport drugs really, really well. But the cool part about the liposome is that even though it's manufactured, it actually mimics our cells in a variety of ways and not just this vesicleness. One of those ways being that it has a phospholipid outer layer that allows the liposome to be protected from our bodily environment, but then also to facilitate exchanges between our bodies and the liposome. And this membrane works with membrane proteins on the outside, 
And what they do is they allow the liposome to release the drugs inside of it exactly where they need to be. And it's this ability of the liposome to target specific areas in our body that make it such a great alternative to treating conditions like inflammation, nutrient deficiencies, and hopefully soon something as groundbreaking as HIV. Now, okay, this seems great and all, I know. What's the catch, right? And that lies in a few questions. So think of the last time you heard about what seems like a really neat molecule. Just think of the last time you saw a publication, an advertisement, just some sort of chatter about the liposome. I'm going to take a wild guess in that you haven't heard much about the liposome until now, and that you also might be wondering why you haven't heard about the liposome until now. And that answer lies in one key factor about the liposome, being that it's not accessible to the average consumer. Or, let's put it a little less eloquently, the liposome is not affordable. But think about it, that makes sense, kind of. It's expensive to manufacture such a complex and such a small molecule, and it's expensive to fund the science behind developing the molecule, and it's also expensive to make the liposome based on demand due to its really poor shelf life. Now, these three components, among, well, many other things, make the liposome expensive. But there's one other component, and it frustrates me, among many other people, that could have access to the liposome, that being the margin of profit healthcare companies make off of selling the liposome to people like me and you. I believe that because the liposome is so versatile in its many uses, functions, purposes, different fluidities, sizes, on and on, that its price should be just as versatile. But, okay, Currently, the liposome, when you're combining it in some sort of cancer immunotherapy treatment, is roughly $200,000. And to put that into perspective, the median household income in America last year was $80,000. So two times the combined salaries of the average American family would not make the liposome a viable alternative to some form of treatment. But what if it could be? I believe that if healthcare companies were to reduce their margin of profit made off of the liposomes considerably, they could expand their audience. By expanding your audience, you can increase the number of consumers available to using your product. Increasing number of consumers can then increase sales, and increasing sales can increase potential for profit, making back the money lost initially when that margin was lowered. And this works because the liposome, as I said earlier, is made based on demand. Increased demand, increased productivity, and thus healthcare companies end up helping themselves by helping me and you. But, okay, maybe the liposome isn't the kind of alternative you're looking for. Maybe you have some sort of condition that there isn't a liposome to treat. So let's apply this to the whole healthcare industry. By minimizing the current emphasis on profit, and maximizing a new emphasis on people like me and you, healthcare companies could serve themselves, thus making access for all beneficial for all, meaning both the consumers and the producers benefit from healthcare expansion. Okay, that was kind of big and all expansive, so let's draw it back a little bit. Let's get a little selfish. Let's talk about me here. What's neat about this is as I do my research about the liposome and as I learn more and more about the costs of different healthcare procedures, I continue to ask the question of, would the liposome have been a viable alternative to my granny's chemotherapy treatment back in 2004? And okay, the short answer is no. Um, most people with newborn babies don't exactly have $200,000 laying around. And my grandmother was not unique in the sense that she spoiled me a ton as a kid. I mean, it was great, and I'm so thankful for that. But that just means we didn't have, I guess, the price of a small house in suburban Atlanta laying around. But pretend we did. Pretend we had $200,000 to spend on some sort of liposomal therapy. The cool part about this hypothetical is that there actually is a liposome that works to help treat breast cancer patients just like my granny. 
This liposome works with a drug called DOX, or doxorubicin, if you really want to get technical. And what DOX does is practically the same thing as chemo, except it has that liposomal specificity I talked about earlier, meaning it would only target cancer cells and not healthy cells, making it that life lengthener and life improver I always thought chemotherapy should be. And thus, this is a really great alternative, but a really inaccessible one, kind of ruling out the whole fun of that what if. But playing what if with healthcare procedures isn't a game unique to me at all. And finding out that so many people have questioned the outcomes of their treatments is exactly why I'm here today. We all deserve to live in a world free of questioning healthcare outcomes just because we couldn't afford any better or couldn't find any better. By ending the emphasis on profit and beginning a new emphasis on the people like my granny, we can expand healthcare access as wide as possible and allow everyone to feel the benefits of cool new modern medicine. And we can do this by expanding access, moving one dollar, and yeah, maybe even one really small molecule at a time. Thank you.